this morning. And uh, we're going to go into a time of prayer, a time of worship together. I don't know about you, but I don't ever want Sunday morning services to become predictable. I don't like that. Matter of fact, I'm ruined forever. I'm just flat ruined forever. I am. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to ever move into a service on Sunday morning and see Sunday morning on people. I want to see Friday night on people. That's what I want. And we want to let the Lord have His way today. Every service that we come into from now on, I've made a pledge to the Lord. Every service that I come into, I'm just going to let the Lord have His way. I'm, uh, I'm just going to let Him have His way. I'm prepared this morning for my message. I worked on it for a long time last night. I think I cut out my lights about 2.30 this morning. And um, I'm prepared to go. I'm ready to preach. But I'm also ready to let the Lord do whatever He wants to do. I just don't like predictability. I was telling someone the other day, you know, in a service, when you move into a service like this, um, sometime you look up and there's, there's a little something that the Lord is doing. And it's almost like the size of a little bitty cube, like a dice. And if you'll pay attention to that, what God's trying to say and what He's trying to do, and you'll give attention to it, first news, you know that that little dice becomes a window. And first news, you know it's a big door that the whole congregation can crawl through. But if you don't pay attention to that little bitty window whenever it first comes, it'll pass, and you'll just have service. I'm tired of just having services. I want God to have His way. Amen? The brethren are going to go ahead now and serve you. I think we have enough. Don't, do we have enough to help us this morning? Okay. Is there enough? Is everybody uh, being served? They are. I know the ushers just took up the offering. So I just wanted to make sure. Lyndall's going to go ahead and lead us in some worship. And um, what about the sound booth back there? Are we ready to go? Okay. Since we're doing this different, you want me to go ahead and just lead worship right now? Okay. I love things different. Could I have the worship team, please? Spontaneity is my middle name. Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Let the oil of glass flow down from your throne put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaven your joy is my strength alone my strength alone sing on these singers put on the garments
Let the choir sing. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Rogers, lift your voice.
I probably need to apologize this morning. First of all, when I wanted to do communion early, I had good intentions, but it didn't work out like that. I had a tape I was going to play for you before we actually are in conjunction with communion. I need to apologize to Lundell because 
People really couldn't get in worship like they wanted to because they had communion in their hand. Okay. And I want to apologize to the Lord because I don't want the Lord to think that we're mishandling the Lord's Supper. I don't want him to think that at all. Lord, I'm sorry. Hallelujah. Are we ready back there? Okay. We're not going to be able to do what I wanted to do, so I'm going to go ahead and lead us in communion so you can be free to worship. I sure don't want the Lord to think that we just mishandled this time here. Lord, we are deeply apologetic because this is the most important part of the service right here. Here's what Jesus said, and I would like you to take your bread, please, and hold it with me. This bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus that was bruised and broken so that our body could be well. <clears throat> you never know sometime how important your body is until it's not working right. You know, probably some of the most hard to get along Christians is the ones that's prospering and in health. A Christian that's prospering and really doesn't have any needs really gets hard to get along with. And a person that walks in health all the time, sometimes they get hard to get along with too. But let a need arise, and you'll see humility come quickly. And Jesus so loved us that he wanted us to do well in every way, that he said, this is my body. He gave it as a ransom. He gave it as a propitiation. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And because his body was broken, our body can be well. And I don't know about you today, but I thank the Lord for a well body. I thank the Lord for a well body. Not long ago, I was at the dentist office, and I had some problems on my mind, and I was burdened with them when I walked in there that morning. He was examining my teeth, and... I've got to go back this Tuesday, as a matter of fact. He was examining my teeth, and he pulled my jaw out, and he looked over on the side of my jaw there, and he said, oh, whoa. He said, hmm, I'm going to have to watch that. And I felt something race through my body, like <clears throat> F-E-A-R, fear. <laughs> because I didn't know what he was seeing. I couldn't see it. He was looking with a mirror all down through there, and he said, hmm, I'm going to have to watch that. And he went on looking at other portions of my mouth. And I remember as soon as he said, hmm, I'm going to have to watch that. I remember every problem I walked in there with that morning all of a sudden was gone. <laughs> it was gone. And now I was focused on, hmm, you know. But then he came back to it and he said, oh, I see what it is. He said, no, that's nothing to be concerned about at all. Don't even think twice about it. I said, Phew, thank you, Jesus. But I learned something that morning. It was good for me because I learned that what I thought was heavy on my heart was not heavy on my heart at all. What I learned was all of a sudden he had a concern in his voice and everything else dissipated and that became a priority. And I want to tell you today, the Lord loves us so much, he tries to take the hmm out of our life. Amen. He said, this is my body. Would you please partake with me of his body? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. You are our Savior and our Master. We love you, Jesus. And then Jesus said, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for remission of sins. And Jesus, this morning, we give it total concentration. We give it total focus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And because of this blood that was shed from his body, it gives us hope for tomorrow. And the Lord said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And I just want to say to him today, Lord, we never forget you. We never do, Jesus. Every day I live, every hour of every day, you're always on my mind. Can you say that? Every hour of every day that I live, he's always on my mind. And we love you, Jesus. Would you please partake with me?
Hallelujah. Once again, Lindell, I'm sorry about that, buddy. Just dispose of your cup and just feel free to worship.
Yes. Come on, lift up your voice. You can do better than that, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Get your harmonica out. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Jesus. Jesus. Bless the Lord. One, two, three, four.
I just think we ought to hear the harmonica a little bit more, all right?
Aleluia. Well, go ahead. Sorry, right, go ahead. Go ahead. Hallelujah. A few days ago, I got a, um, an email from uh, Dutch Sheets. I may have told you about that. And in that email, he was really concerned. He went to his church and um, for a Wednesday night service, just a common Wednesday night service. And the Spirit of the Lord came on him very strong. He said the strongest that the Lord's ever come on him, and he's never wept that hard in his whole life. And he said his church went into intercession and he said the Lord spoke to him and told him that he was putting intercession on him for America. I was with Pat Robertson Friday night in Pennsylvania, and Pat Robertson mentioned the same thing. And then a week ago, last Wednesday night, I was with Mike Bickle in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And that night before I spoke, I, I think, I'm not sure what came on me. I'll say it was just the Spirit of the Lord. But um, uh, before I preached that night, I said, I feel a real burden on my heart. And this is before I knew anything from what anybody else was saying. I feel a real burden on my heart, not only for Jerusalem, I said tonight, but also for America over the next 30 to 45 days. So um, I know that we have the elections coming up, and I know that right now things are really stirred up in the Middle East. And um, I've got something I want you to hear. Some of you have probably already heard this on the radio. Um, Brother Glenter has been playing this. This came to my attention while I was on the road this week in Jacksonville. A Christian radio station there brought this to me and wanted me to hear it. And immediately when I heard it, I thought of you and I wanted you to hear it in case you haven't heard it. This is the mayor of Jerusalem. And uh, the mayor of Jerusalem is begging Christians in America to please be concerned about the peace treaty that President Clinton is trying to put over on Barack and Arafat. And he will plainly tell you in this five minute segment that if this peace agreement goes through, that Israel will lose control of the garden tomb and Israel will lose control of other holy sites that now Christians can so freely go to and they're kept up and taken care of. You saw last week when they got into a big problem there in the Middle East, the, uh, the Palestinians came in and burned and desecrated Joseph's tomb. So right now in the Middle East, you know, they're trying to get them back to the peace table, but I believe, my personal opinion is, I believe God short-circuited that peace agreement and won't let it take place because it's not in the will of God. And my concern, and I want to stick by my guns, and I don't mean to sound, sound to be alarmist, and I don't mean to sound condemning, but I have a real concern in my heart for the president if he tries to push this thing, it's going to be dangerous for him. He's going to incur the wrath of God on him. You don't use Jerusalem and the holy things of God as a political pawn. And you don't use it to try to overcome your legacy of adultery. You hear what I'm saying? I said you don't use a holy city that has a biblical history to it and a future to it to try to bring peace in the area and forfeit a holy thing to try to bring uh, a, a thing that will clear up your legacy and try to get people to get their mind off of you committing adultery while you was in office. I know I'm being blunt, but I think it's time that we quit trying to be politically correct. <laughs> I'm, really, uh, I'm really so tired of hearing people get up and tiptoe around and try to be politically correct. I'm real sick of that. I think it's time for somebody to come out and just, you know, just God's people just come out and just call the shots like they are. And um, 
this thing in, in regard to Jerusalem is a very serious thing. And I don't think that the average person really realizes how serious Jerusalem is. I woke up Friday morning, and um, when I came awake, I didn't hear anything. Usually the Lord speaks to me a lot whenever I wake up. And I'm not even saying this was God speaking to me, but I think it has significance. I woke up Friday morning in my coach, and as I was waking up, I didn't see anything, but I saw a hand on an old, like a, like a teletype, like one of these Morse code things, you know, that sends up, you know. And a, a tape was coming out of a machine as this finger was mashing out this Morse code. A tape was coming out of this machine that said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And um, up at our men's conference there in Pennsylvania Friday night, I asked the men if they'd stand with me and pray. And 45 minutes later, they stopped praying. A spirit of prayer broke out. But I want you to be seated for just a few moments. And uh, I want you to hear this five minute, I think it's about a six minute a message from the mayor of Jerusalem. I'd like for everybody to hear this. And then we're going to come back in just a few minutes and we're going to pray in regard to Jerusalem. Now, one thing I want to say too, before you start that, I don't want anybody to ever get tired of John Kilpatrick coming up here behind this podium and bringing attention to Jerusalem. Because... I want to feel free behind my own pulpit to bring attention to where I believe God's heart is right now. And there's a lot of areas where God's heart is, is today, but this is one area right here that I know God's heart is really toward the Jews. This is end time, end of the age events. And this is stuff that's very important. You may be sitting out there thinking, even as you hear this tape, well, what's the big deal? If you just understood Bible prophecy, you would understand it's a major big deal. It is a major big deal. This has, this has the um, connections to really drastically affect your life, uh, the American economy. It has the potential to affect uh, a lot of different things. But the most important thing is I want you to remember that right now the issue is not Israel so much. The issue now has focused on Jerusalem. They just had an Arab conference in Egypt at the same place where President Clinton met last week with all the leaders. They had a, uh, an Arab conference in the same building in Egypt hosted by uh, President Mubarak this week, this weekend, and they came out with a strong statement condemning Israel. And um, Pres our Prime Minister Mubarak said this morning, that he was going to take a time out from the peace negotiations and the peace, um, Camp David peace accords. He was going to take a time out because day before yesterday, there was 10 Palestinians killed. Yesterday, there was four Palestinians killed. And so the thing just has a real potential to go into a mess in a hurry overnight. President Clinton knows that. But my, my belief is, and my opinion is, and I'm not speaking politically, I'm just speaking because I'm concerned in my spirit. If the president keeps tampering with this until January when he goes out and another, and another man's inaugurated, if he keeps tampering with this for the next days, it has a potential to really get nasty. And uh, now the issue is Jerusalem. We're in, I believe that we're coming to Zechariah chapter 12. And then if you look over, don't do it right now, but if you look over when you get home, just two chapters after Zechariah chapter 12, Jesus comes back and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. So I think we're coming close to that. So it's not the boundaries and the city limits of Israel anymore. I mean, the, the, the parameters of, of Israel anymore. Now it's the issue of Jerusalem. And that's where things have to get to before the Antichrist will surface and sign a peace accord with Israel. So in a nutshell, here's what's going on. The Middle East is going to become increasingly difficult. It's going to become increasingly impossible for the Palestinians and Israelis to live together. President Clinton will not be the peacemaker. That's a done deal. He's out of the picture. He will not be a peacemaker. He can stir up things and cause problems, but he's not the one that the Bible says will come and sign a peace treaty with Israel. It will not be Bill Clinton. 
It will be the man called the Antichrist. He will be a man of peace. It's a false peace. It's a false Messiah. But he will come, and I believe that time is approaching whenever he's going to surface, because everything is right. Everything is, is, is right now. I don't think it was right in 1991 when you had the Iraq-Kuwait war. It wasn't right then. It didn't feel right. But now, due to the advent of the Internet, computerization technology becoming so intricate and so high-tech, I think everything pretty well is getting close to the time that a man can step up and can actually rule the world in a sinister way as the Antichrist will do. But he's first of all going to befriend Israel. Israel's going to think their Messiah has come. And uh, after three and a half years of so-called peace, all hell is going to break loose. So right now we find ourselves in a time where the Antichrist must be declared sometime in the near future. I believe the church will be gone before then. I believe that. But I just want you to know that we're so close to that man emerging to bring peace to the Middle East because nobody else will be able to do it, that you can see that the clamoring right now is not so much for a peace accord, but for a man of peace to come and ensure the Israelis' peace. So I want you to listen to this tape. This is an urgent message from the mayor of Jerusalem. I am Ehud Olmert, mayor of the city of Jerusalem. And I speak to all of you from Jerusalem, the holy city, the greatest city in the world, a place where Jews, Muslims, and millions of Christians from all over the world come to practice their beliefs. And now, on these very days, the city of Jerusalem is in some danger. You may have heard that the political status of the city of Jerusalem is now under consideration. And uh, there is a political process which involves the United States of America, President Clinton, the leaders of the Arab countries, in particular the leader of the Palestinian autonomy, Mr. Arafat, and the State of Israel. And the most sensitive part of this political process is the claims of the Muslims to take over the Temple Mount and claim sovereignty for the Palestinians and the Muslims over the Temple Mount. This is the most sensitive, the most important of all the issues that are now under consideration for the peace process. And many people come to me and they ask me, do we Christians have to say something? Is our opinion important in the context of this process? Shall we speak up? And I want to take this opportunity that I speak to you today and ask you, please, speak up. Jerusalem is so important for you. There are so many important places that are so sacred to hundreds of millions of Christians in Jerusalem. Jesus lived in Jerusalem. Jesus died in Jerusalem. And you know, my friends, that for the last 33 years, we, the State of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, have protected all the sites that are so important to you. For one simple reason, because we have enormous respect for your religion and enormous respect for your tradition. You are part of Jerusalem. You are part of the history of Jerusalem. You are part of the future of Jerusalem. And you, all of you who read the Old Testament, as we do every day, the Jewish people here in Jerusalem, you know that God wanted the Jewish people to build their temples in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is first and foremost the site of the Jewish temples. And God wants the Jewish people to keep sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Of course, according to our tradition, 
according to our values, all the holy sites in the city of Jerusalem, everywhere, should be open for everyone. There should be free access to all the holy sites. All believers from all over the world should come to our city and enjoy the beauty of this great place and pray to God. And we make sure that you can do it in a spirit of freedom and tolerance and respect because this is how we treat our tradition. This is how we treat the tradition of others. Therefore, you should speak up. Raise your voices. We need to hear your voices. We love to hear your voices. We want to hear them from across the world, coming from all sides, saying to President Clinton, to Prime Minister Barack, and to the Palestinian people, don't touch Jerusalem. Don't split the city. Don't spoil the Temple Mount. I hear all the time Chairman Arafat directly and through his representatives arguing that he is the defender not just of the Muslims in Jerusalem but also of the Christians. That he speaks for the Christian communities when he demands full Palestinian sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem. And I wonder, does he speak for the Christian communities? Are Christian communities interested in having a Muslim control over the most precious sites for the Christian people in Jerusalem? Are you asking Chairman Arafat to be the savior of the Christian sites in Jerusalem? No. Is it possible? Is it true? Can it happen? I must say, I doubt it. I don't believe. But you need to speak. You need to say what you feel. The world is waiting for your words. The leaders will be listening. You will speak up. And all of us will do what we need to do to protect Jerusalem, to remain forever a one city, a meeting place of all different religions, a place of love and tolerance. Thank you. Don't stand, please. <clears throat> wow. What do you think? <clears throat> I heard while Chairman Arafat was at <clears throat> the Arab summit this weekend he made the statement again. It was carried live on CNN. We all heard it if you listen. He said just yesterday, he said, I will not stop until I make Jerusalem the capital of the Palestinian people. So he's out with it. He's out with it. It's out. That's his statement. That's his purpose. <clears throat> That's his goal. And the issue here again is not Israel, but the issue is Jerusalem. I also heard <clears throat> that Israel said about 10 days ago, they said there will be no Masada for us again. They said there will never be another Masada for us. They said we will fight till the last drop of blood for our city of Jerusalem and for our homeland of Israel. So friend, there we have it. We have something to pray about this morning. And I want you with me for the next few minutes <clears throat> to just lift your voice, express your heart to the Lord. Yeah, it's important to let President Clinton and people like that know, but the Bible says, here's what the Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And when I came awake Friday morning and I saw that instrument tapping out those words, and then they were being printed on a little tape coming out of a machine, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Man, I said, God, I don't know what's up, but I know that this is my church, this is my flock, this is my congregation, 
and I've been a lot of places over this nation in the last five days. <clears throat> it was one of those busy weeks that I've had that I had to do this week. And I only got to preach one time out of five times this last week because prayer broke out in a major way. And the power of God broke out in a major way. And I'm not saying that's going to happen this morning. I'm not even insinuating that it should. But I am saying this is the church where I pastor. These are the people that I love. And I know you know how to pray. And for the next few minutes, I want us to do just that. I want us to pray for Jerusalem. Come on, lift your voices with me. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Lord, how we need your help. How we need your help, Lord. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. She da 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 muri an da 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 ma ma da da na ma ma da. Come on, friends. Come on. Let's pray. Come on, everybody. Let's pray. Muri an dri bi arah kusuri an tulo bi an doya. Jesus, we pray, Lord, for Jerusalem today. We lift them up, Lord. We lift up the inhabitants of Israel. We lift up, Lord, the inhabitants of the Holy Land. God, I pray that you'll deal with our president. Lord, don't let him force the Israeli people to give up Jerusalem. Lord, stop the peace negotiations, we ask you. Let the will of God be done, Lord. Let the will of God be done in Israel as it is in heaven. Let the will of God be done for Jerusalem as your word dictates, Lord. Father, we bind every plot, every plan, every scheme that violates the Word of God. Bring it to naught, Jesus. Bring every plan of the devil to naught. Bring the plans of Yasser Arafat to naught. Lord, bring the plans of anybody that's not right. Bring their schemes and their plans to naught. In the powerful name of Jesus, Lord, today we lift up Jerusalem, the city on the hill. Lord, and we cry out for it. We ask, Lord, for peace. Peace for Jerusalem. Peace, Lord, for Jerusalem. Peace for Jerusalem. Lord, we speak that the chaos and the fighting and the warring would begin to diminish and that, Lord, your will will be done. Father, we pray that you'll begin to stir the church to know that the end of the age is upon us and we cannot afford to neglect it any longer. We must refocus. We must retool. We must pray afresh and anew for the hour is approaching when the Son of Man shall return. Oh God, give us a renewed vision. Give us a renewed heart for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus. In your powerful name we ask it, Lord. Woo! Katariando. I want everybody to stand together. I want you to grab hands with the person beside you all the way across the aisles and lift them up and let's lift our voices together. Come on. Let's let heaven hear us this morning. Come on. Woo! Jesus.
Jesus. Help him, Jesus. Ida by the name in the Divi Alamandu to Kupara Lamandu for Yantai.
Jesus. 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 You know, my heart, when I heard that tape from the mayor of Jerusalem, my heart broke, man. First time I heard it, my heart broke. You haven't heard, you haven't heard another mayor anywhere in the world make a tape like that and send out asking people to pray for his city. Here's a man that's a Jew almost begging. Israel's, their back's against the wall. And this man has had to resort to tape, sending tapes out to Christians in America, Christian radio stations in America. This man has had to resort to making tapes and sending them to Christians in America, begging us to please pray for his city. Man, when I heard that, my heart just broke for him because they know they're not getting a fair shake on television. They know they won't get a fair shake in the United Nations. They know that. And so they're saying, please, Christians, please, Christians, if you love us, if you care for us, pray for us, and please contact some of your politicians and tell them don't do this to us. Man, that's sad. Let's just pray a few more minutes and I'm going to preach. Jesus. Jesus. Lord, we heard the cry of this man. We heard the cry of his heart, Jesus. We heard that mayor crying out to the church to pray for him. Now, Lord, we're going to do it. We're going to do it, Jesus. We're going to do it, Jesus. We're going to do it, Jesus. Oh, come, oh, come. I want to <clears throat> just say one more thing. Everywhere I've been this week on the road, when I've talked like this, I've had people get up and walk out on me. And I don't know if they did it this morning here or not. I didn't really look around, but I'll just say this to you. Wherever I go, I'm going to talk about Jerusalem. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'm going to talk about Jerusalem. And I'm going to do exactly what the Bible says to do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm to the point with this thing, even about revival and whatever, I'm to the point that my life really doesn't mean anything. I mean, these remaining days that God's given me on the earth, I'm going to really focus and get as much done for God as I can because I know that the end of this age is coming to a close. And... Um, I even had some, had some ministers uh, get all puffed up about it. But you know, I made up my mind, I'm gonna do what I know is right if everybody walks out on me. I'm gonna do what I know is right. I really am.
And, uh, you know, they'll say, well, pray for the Palestinians. We do pray for the Palestinians. I pray for Yasser Arafat, and I pray for the president. But the Bible never said pray for the Palestinian city. It said pray for Jerusalem. And I'm praying for Jerusalem. I'm sticking with what the Scripture says. And I don't care what anybody says. Israel's not really gotten a fair shake in the media. You know it, and I know it. And if you don't know it, you're deceived. They've not gotten a fair shake in the media. And yes, it's tragic that Palestinians has been killed. And yes, it's tragic about all the political ramifications. It's tragic. But I'm going to do what God says. We're going to pray for Jerusalem. Hey, get your Bibles and get prepared to turn with me in the book of James. And we're going to sing a song real quick. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I'm not going to go along this morning, honestly. James chapter 3. Stand, please, for the reading of the Word. James chapter number 3, and we're going to look at verse 16. <clears throat> this is part 2 of the message from last week. Wow. If any kind of indication of last week, I got emails, letters, telephone calls, people stopping me, people calling me. Man, Pastor, I needed that. So I figured I'd go ahead this morning and give you the other dose of it. I was thinking I'd probably go on this about a month, but I'm going to finish it up this morning because I want to go a different route next Sunday. So you can now breathe a sigh of relief. Whew, wow, that's good. I'm dealing with a spirit of strife. And last week, I was thinking about all this Middle East stuff, and I heard the Lord say to me, he said, oh, but son, he said the Middle East, he said the strife is not the only place, the Middle East is not the only place where strife is. He said there's strife 
among my people that breaks my heart. And um, strife is something that probably few people really have got a handle on. Uh, you know, you say anger, and a lot of people immediately their mind clicks and they understand anger. You say bitterness, and their mind clicks, they understand bitterness. But when you say the word strife, that's sort of a word that unless somebody brings attention to it, you probably don't even really realize that you're caught up in it. And so today, for just a few minutes, I've only got a few points. I want to deal with part two, the spirit of strife. And we're reading in James chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Look at that. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. You may be seated. The dictionary defines strife as fighting, conflict, bitter dissension, a struggle, or contention. It is also defined as debate, provocation, and factions. My belief is that many Christians have slipped into a spirit of strife and they don't even recognize it as the root of their problem. <clears throat> I want to just give one illustration that I gave last week, and I promise I won't spend any time on it. I'm going to move on. But let me just give one more one illustration that I gave last week. I have preached here for years at this church that the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Now, <clears throat> wrath is also a deceptive word. Because you don't have to be like that, you know, to be in wrath. You can be peaceful looking on the outside and be full of wrath on the inside. You understand that? <clears throat> you can look tranquil and peaceful on the outside, but on the inside, man, you're full of strife and you know it. And then there's times that it sort of boils over like a volcano, like lava shooting out whenever you lose your temper. But that lava that's shooting out of the dome of your mouth didn't just happen in five seconds. It was seething under there a long time. But the right provocation or the right thing that happens to you that makes you feel deprived or like you're getting the short end of the stick or you're unappreciated or you're not being recognized or <clears throat> you're not being listened to, or you're not in control. Pow! That thing right there is like a, uh, a little deal that clicks, and all of a sudden that lava comes out, and it's bitter words, it's pride, it's arrogance, it's meanness, it's, it's, um, it's something that, that makes you cut people with your tongue. <clears throat> and um, last week, I was thinking about this, and when the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, oh, but the Middle East is not the only place where there's dissension. He said, there's so much strife among my people. I began to give that some serious thought, and I parked there. You know, usually a preacher has always got a lot of sermon material on his mind. For 30 some odd years, I've walked around every day of the week with sermon material on my mind. And before a series ever comes out of my mouth over a microphone, it's been working in my heart probably for weeks. But last week, whenever the Lord began to deal with me about this thing on strife, I saw something and I said, whoa, man, the church really needs to hear this. The body of Christ really needs to hear this because, you know, <clears throat> I think this is one of those areas that needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed in more than just one setting because last week it brought it to your attention and you've thought about it all week and a lot of things begin to make sense to you. 
But today, as you've come back, we're going to talk about it again. And more things are going to come together for you. And I think a lot of you is going to get more free this week than you were last week. Sometimes freedom comes sort of in degrees. You know, the, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Well, sometimes if you just have a portion of truth, you just get a portion of freedom. And um, so you, you got to keep dealing with the subject. You got to keep, keep your spade in the shovel, and your shovel in the ground and keep turning that dirt. You know, keep pulverizing it to get it ready for what the Holy Spirit's trying to say. Now, for years I have preached here behind this pulpit in regard to family situations, not to let the sun go down in your wrath. And um, I've given this illustration, and I want you to just listen to it one more time because it's so true. If you go to bed at night with unforgiveness in your heart, and, and uh, something has happened between you and your mate, or you and your children, you know, under the, your roof, and you go to bed at night, and God has given you those kids as your heritage, and he's given your spouse as your helpmate, and you go to bed at night, and there's a problem, and you're not straightening that out, and you're not getting it under the blood, and you're not repenting, or she's not repenting, or the kids are not repenting, and you just, as the head of your house, let everybody go to bed like that. In my mind, I have a picture of while you, when your eyes close in sleep, and you didn't do what you knew you were supposed to do, in my mind, it's like the walls of your house begin to slide and open up. And it's like um, strong spirits move from outside where they were kept at bay by the blood and by unity. And it's like the walls just sort of slide back and in comes strong spirits of discord and dissension and um, havoc, confusion. And boy, when they come in, it's not like you wake up the next morning and all of a sudden you're in a better mood. You wake up the next morning, you're in a worse mood. And things are worse. Every pastor that's been in the ministry for any period of time can talk to you just like I'm talking to you. This is not something unique with John Kilpatrick. But every pastor that's been in the ministry for any period of time that's done counseling, which I've done years of it, will tell you that a man and his wife that's tremendously in love and respects one another and prays together, worships together, can get to a point that they actually talk divorce. And what gets them to that point where they can actually talk divorce is because something crept in and you can call it anger, you can call it uh, bitterness, you can call it unforgiveness, but I think probably a, a real good word would be the word strife. Because strife is one of those words that if not defined, can sort of creep in on you and it has a lot of roots to it, a lot of offshoots to it that affects you. So I'm gonna use the word strife. And they can actually start talking divorce. And then you wake up the next morning and things seem to be worse. Your mind is in a gear that it wasn't in 24 hours ago. Now all of a sudden, things are really cooking. Now you're saying hurtful things. Now you're saying things that you've kept locked up for a long time. And they're coming out, they're spewing out. And sometimes when a spirit of strife gets a hold of you, you say things that you really can't take back. You may ask forgiveness for it, but there's a wound and a hurt in the heart of your mate or your children that they may forgive you, but it still, it hurt them deeply. And Satan relishes in that. Don't you just hate the devil? You know, I hate the devil because he relishes in the fact whenever people get hurt. I hate to see anybody hurt. Man, whenever somebody starts crying, I want to leave. I want to leave the room. Or either I want to reach out there and grab them and pull them to me and comfort them. But I hate the devil because the devil just relishes in seeing people get hurt 
wounded, offended, grieved. He just relishes in that. And I hate him for that. And if the devil wants to tear up your marriage, he could not choose a more accurate tool than the tool of strife. Now, the Bible uh, talks about the Christians being armed with the armor of God. It talks about the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. It talks about feet shod in preparation of the gospel of peace. It talks about the sword. It talks about the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the sword of the word, and all that. But I also believe that, he that hell has some armor. And I believe that strong spirits wear the devil's armor, and I believe they wear a helmet of pride, a breastplate of unrighteousness, a sword of bitterness, a shield of hatred, a hammer of criticism, cloak of deception, boots of anger, and a mouth speaking forth great lies. And you might say, Brother Kilpatrick, how in the world do I know if I'm affected by a spirit of strife? Because it involves bickering, it involves arguing over petty things that develops into big things. Heated disagreements with many angry undercurrents. And people will argue over the silliest stuff. And then after it's over and they had a big, big fight, they wonder what the world it was about. But that little issue that came up was just enough of an irritant that pricked the head of that rising and caused that pus of strife to pour out in whatever form it, it came out in. Now, today, I want to cover six areas, and I want to do them quickly. I want to cover six areas where the spirit of strife will affect your life. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to ask you, just don't make notes. Just really, just give me your best ear and your undivided attention. And the ch tapes are real cheap back there. And you'll get more out of a tape than you would making notes. Some people feel they need to be right all the time. <clears throat> Let me say that again. <laughs> because evidently we don't have anybody here like that this morning. <laughs> but some people feel like they need to be right all the time. And they enter into arguments. They love to enter into arguments so they can prove they're right. Husbands do it with their wives. And wives do it with their husbands. And they go to great extremes to prove that they're right. And then after they prove they're right, they really want to make you look bad. They really want to make you look like, well, you don't love me or you don't think much of me, or you don't appreciate me, you don't respect me. See how you don't respect me? You don't believe me when I tell you things. See, I was right. I'm always right. Oh. Somebody help me out right now. <clears throat> and they go to extremes to prove they're right. And too many of us feel that we're always being challenged if anybody asks us a question that we don't want to be asked. And if you ever feel challenged by your mate, you see, if I understand it correctly, uh, a marriage between a man and a woman ought to be a give and take. But sometime when strife creeps in, a man isolates himself or a woman isolates themselves and they feel like they're the perfect one, they're the wounded one, and they feel like if the other mate encroaches in on their territory and asks them questions, they feel like they're being challenged. Like you don't appreciate my wisdom or you don't appreciate my counsel. You don't think I'm right. You never think I'm right. And so you feel challenged whenever you're questioned. And it causes you to live in a constant state of frustration. Always frustrated, ill to be with. Short fuse, because you're trying to convince everybody you knew what you was talking about, but in the meantime, you're acting like a martyr. And people live frustrated because they feel challenged 
And whenever you live like that, it's a definite sign that you're not free. Now, I want to, I want to just take a moment here and turn to Scripture, and I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. And boy, his wisdom just comes out here. And it's not only Paul's wisdom, but it's the Word of God. Look what he says in chapter 2, verse 24. He says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. And the opposite of striving is, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. But let me show you what happens. Look this way just for a moment. Let me, well. <laughs> I'm trying. Let, let me show you something here that, that is really important. You know what we do sometimes? The devil gets us caught up in issues that don't amount to a hill of beans. I mean don't amount to a hill of beans. Now you listening to me. I said, the devil gets us caught up in issues that don't amount to nothing. I mean nothing. When it's over and done with, you got your heart rate up, you got your blood pressure up, you said things, and after it's all over, it didn't mean nothing. That's a sure sign that you're in a spirit of strife. You're looking for an opportunity to ventilate because something's going on there. Now, one of the scriptures that I want to go back to, I read verse 24, but I want to go back to verse 23 because this, this uh, really, I feel like, nails the issue. He says, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Foolish and unlearned questions. You know what I will not do? I will not enter into a foolish, stupid conversation. And I will not enter into foolish arguments. You know what? I've been, there's been a lot of people try to suck me into arguments about this and that and the other religiously and otherwise, and I'm not going to do it. Husbands and wives have come in and counseled me before and tried to suck me into their issues that they were involved in, and it was just petty stuff. But the deeper issue was not what they were arguing about. The deeper issue was, it was a spirit of strife had a hold of them, and the devil had turned a spirit of strife loose in their home. And um, the apostle said here to Timothy, he said, avoid foolish things like that. He said, avoid unlearned questions. And he said, foolish questions, knowing that they gender strife. In other words, when you get started in it, it's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. One of the things you and your mate needs to do is make a decision to not enter into a conversation that's going nowhere. If you can fix something, go there. If you can't fix it, don't even waste time and talk about it. Are you listening to me? So the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is some people feel like they need to be right all the time. That's a spirit of strife. And now I want to take you to the second area that I want to talk about. And I want to talk about how strife can affect your blessings. How many of you want to live a good life? In order to do it, you don't need a new wife. In order to do it, you don't need another husband. All you need to do is swallow your pride and humble yourself and repent. That's all you need to do. Because you see, it's just like if a pastor says, oh, this church, oh, I can't stand it. Sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so, they just give me the devil. I'm going to resign and I'm moving to Saginaw. 
Well, I got news for you. When you get to Saginaw, brother and sister so-and-so have a different name, but it's the same old spirit. And in a marriage, you may say, I'm going to put this woman away. I can't live with her. But go ahead and put her away and get you another one. Same old stuff. You know why? Because the problem is not always out there. The problem is in here most of the time. Are you listening to me? And I want to tell you something else too, friend. You reap what you sow. And if you was hard on your ex-wife, your new wife is going to be hard on you. <laughs> Jesus. I, I, I shouldn't have went there. But the Lord is trying to show us that life is good and it's enjoyable. He, mean, he means for it to be good and enjoyable. And um, he wants people to live in harmony and keep the strife out of their life. That's the plan of God. And unity is a wonderful thing and it's a blessing from the Lord. And the Bible talks about, um, in just a moment I'm going to take you there, it talks about the oil on the head of the high priest Aaron. And it's talking about headship there. It says unity is like precious anointing oil on the head of the high priest. And let me say this to you. I want everybody to look this way and let me, let me just make this point real clear. Did you know that where unity is, the anointing is? And where unity is not, the anointing is not. As the oil on Aaron's head, the high priest, it was anointing oil. It says, unity of the brethren, how precious it is and how good it is. And where there is unity, there is preciousness and there is good things and there's anointing. But where there's not unity, it's not good and it's not precious, and there's not an anointing. That's the deduction that you and I need to make from this this morning. And um, I, I want to say this too before I really get too deep into this particular point. Um, sometime you can not only have strife with a person, but you can have strife with a place. you can have a real problem with a place, like your workplace, for example. There can be such a spirit of strife on your job that long after your supervisor got transferred or long after the person working in the office with you quit, that place represented such pain to you that whenever you walk there and go in that building and punch that time clock, a spirit of strife comes all over you even though the person that was involved in that is long gone. And a place can stand for strife. I'll tell you something else. There's people that's left churches before where strife broke out and they left under real bad conditions. They fought the pastor. They fought the board. Maybe the pastor wasn't right. Maybe the board wasn't right. And there was a real conflict there. But long after that pastor moved on or long after you work that out somehow, you still drive by that church and you can't hardly look at it. And when you do look at it, you feel something well up in you. It's a place that engenders strife. The home I was raised in was hell. And to this day, I'm 50 years old. If I would drive back to my hometown today and pull up in the driveway of that house, I would feel cold and clammy. See what I'm saying? And sometime it's not just a person that you've got a problem with when it comes to strife, but sometime it's what a place stands for that just accentuates that strife. But the Bible says that unity is like a precious anointing on the high priest. Where there's unity, here's what God promised he would do. Now look this way, on, on, I mean, look at the scripture. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really trying real hard. Psalms 133. I'm really trying, man. I tell you, this is difficult. 
And I got a lot of emails this week that said, Pastor, don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. So, I might, might just get to where I don't worry about it. I don't know. Just depends on how I do here this morning. I want to ask you a question. How many of you are really concerned about peace in your life? You know what? Out of all the things that I want besides a relationship with Jesus is I want peace. I love peace. I hate trouble. Now, in Psalms 133, I want to show you a scripture. Just, just before we read that, though, let me explain something to you. I want to show you how that strife in your life can affect your prosperity. You know, I believe that there's a lot of people in the kingdom of God that could have been so much more well off financially if they had not operated and lived in a spirit of strife. I believe that there is something that God does when people live in unity and peace. There's a prosperity about that that I believe God kisses. If you don't believe it, look at this scripture. It says in Psalms 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious anointing oil upon the head that ran, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. But, whoa, 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 look at this. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. You see that? Now, if I get this scripture right, if I'm not mistaken here, I understand this scripture to say how good, how pleasant for people to live in unity. It's like the anointing oil on the head of Aaron's beard that ran down over his beard, went down to the skirts of his garment, and God said, there in a place of unity is where I command my blessings. Now, I want to ask, I want to ask you a question. If there is the place of blessings in unity and harmony, wouldn't it make sense that disunity and disharmony is the place where there's maybe a curse? What's the opposite of life? What's the opposite of blessing? What's the opposite of unity? Disunity. What's the opposite of peace? Yeah. Disharmony. So God said, I command my blessing there. Now, I want everybody to listen to something. I'm no fool. I understand something. I understand that God has done a powerful thing at Brownsville Assembly. I know he has. Because I've been here 19 years and I've seen it from the get-go, buddy. I know. I look at it every day and I think about it every day. I know what God's done. And I'm no fool. I know that there's unity here and there's harmony here. I can feel it. I can feel it when it is, and I can feel it when it ain't. But I have not felt disunity in this church in years, and I don't feel any today. If it was here, I wouldn't have to get up behind a microphone and tell you, you could feel it. Because here's what would happen. People would come in just like normal on a normal Sunday morning. One Sunday, two Sundays, three Sundays, four Sundays, and after a while, the choir doesn't have tears running down their face. After a while, people's not manifesting under the Spirit of God. After a while, the preacher gets up to preach. He's hindered. He struggles every sermon. After a while, there's no love in one another. After a while, you begin to hear little rumblings in the church. Everything has flip-flopped now, and it's changed. Where there was growth and harmony and unity, now there's disharmony, disunity, and a back door where people's headed out by the bundles. And I want to tell you something else, too. I'm no fool. I know that because there's unity here, God kissed this place and sent mighty revival, and he also sent his blessings here. There's a blessing here. 
There's a blessing being the pastor of this church. There's a blessing being a member of this church. It's a blessing. God has commanded his blessings here. And he says where the anointing is and where unity is and the anointing, they're, they're twins. Unity and anointing are twins. And he said, I've sent my anointing there. And he said, I've sent my blessing there. But I would like to ask the question now in your life, if there's disunity in your home, And you and your wife or you and your husband just cannot get it together. You once were happy. You once were in love. You once were sexually attracted to one another. You once had it together. But now all of a sudden, there's disharmony. There's disunity. And I'll guarantee you, I would stand flat-footed right here and guarantee you that if there's disunity in your house, there's a clogged up pipe of the blessings of God in your house. The blessings are not flowing like they should. The blessings of God are not manifest and evident like they were whenever you was in love, whenever you were romantic with your mate, whenever you had great communication going on. Now all of a sudden you're striving. Now all of a sudden you're trying to demand that you're right, and all of a sudden you're trying to make demands that this other one can form and see it your way. You're not in give and take anymore. And there's disunity there. And where there's disunity, there's no anointing oil. And where there's disunity, there's no good things. There's no pleasant things. Your home is not pleasant anymore. Oh, you have guests over. You pour the Coke. You got this charismatic smile on your face for your friends. But after they leave, you sail into your loved one and just get all over them because they didn't do like you said to do or they didn't act like you wanted them to act. But while your friends were there, you put on this charismatic air about you that everything was fine. But as soon as they were gone, you were just like this in each other's throats. And that's the way you live. I tell you, friend, as your pastor, I'm warning you there's a spirit of discord and there's a spirit of strife in your life. And I'll tell you something else. As a pastor, I have never down through the years put up with it. When I sensed it, I would not put up with it. I won't let my head rest till I find out where it's coming from. I don't care if it's coming from the chief board member. I don't care if it's coming from my most beloved staff member. I will not rest until I go and get that thing straight and lay the ax to the root and restore peace again. Are you listening to me? You know what, if a pastor is willing to do that and must do that in his church to keep peace, how much more should you do it in your home? You know what, one of the reasons why people love church so much is because when a pastor is strong like that, there's peace in his church and people love to come there. But yet when they dismiss and go home, there's hell in their home. Think how wonderful it would be if we had peace at church and peace at home. I got something I'm going to show you in just a minute that'll just rock your boat. Looking, this is not it. I'm going to go, I'm going to set it up with this scripture, but look at Proverbs 17. I'm just going to set you up with this verse. How can you be effective in your home if there's strife between you and your family? I'm asking you a question. I want to ask you something else. What good is tithing? And what good is taking communion on Sunday morning if for six days a week or four days a week, whatever it is, you're home together, you just cannot get along and there's a spirit of strife in your home. What good is it to do all these sacrifices? You know, the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. And, you know, but we think somehow in our religious minds that if we just do the sacrifices, God's going to wink at the other. God says, I ain't winking at the other. Matter of fact, I want to show you a very powerful scripture. It's found in Proverbs chapter 17, and we'll look at it together. Verse 1, better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. 
See that? Then a house full of sacrifices with strife. The, better, the Bible says it's better to have a dry morsel, freeze-dried food, and quietness than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Man, strife in the home and strife in the marriage and bickering and arguments open the door to the devil in ways that I can't begin to explain to you. Somebody answer that phone, please. <laughs> what? Okay. Number four, I'm getting in strife right now. <laughs> Number four, there's a direct link between the peace of God and the presence of God. Do you believe that? Now, I want to talk about that a little bit this morning. This is, this is really powerful. I believe that there's a real era in warfare, spiritual warfare. I know that there comes a time that we've got to get demonstrative and, you know, we've got to be um, extroverted when it comes time to, you know, do warfare and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you just never saw Jesus doing that kind of stuff. He never said, devil! <laughs> you know, he just never did do that, did he? Satan, Lucifer, you stronghold, come here! You know, he never did that. Let me show you something about warfare. If you really want to go take a real strong look at warfare, let me show you how Jesus did it. Now watch this. Look this way. Go to Exodus, chapter 14. Somebody said, Brother Kilpatrick, I like you sometime and sometime I don't. <laughs> One lady came up to me and when I first came to Brownsville years ago, I told the church, I said, I'm the type of pastor that you'll either really love me or you'll really hate me. And she came up to me one Sunday after I'd been there for several years and she said, I used to really love you. <laughs> now, you remember whenever Israel came down and they were getting ready to be delivered from Egyptian bondage? You remember they came down to the Red Sea? And the Red Sea was before them and Pharaoh's army was behind them. The Egyptians were there well-trained army, and Israel was really in a dilemma. They needed an answer. But I want to show you something that God said to Israel, and man, it is so powerful. When I saw this, I said, wow, look at that. Y'all ready to say, wow, look at that. Y'all ready to do that? Let's look at it together. Exodus chapter 14. The Bible says in verse 9, the Egyptians pursued after them, horses, chariots, Pharaoh and his horsemen, they overtook them camping by the sea. And Pharaoh drew nigh, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto the Lord, they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, you've taken us away to die in the wilderness. Therefore, you've dealt with us and carried us out of Egypt. And it's not the word that we do. <laughs> so... Here's what God said to Moses to tell the people of Israel in verse 13. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye seen today, you will see them again no more forever. Now, stop right there and... No, we're not, not yet. Not yet. Not now. We're going to do that in the next place, next verse. I'm just trying to say, yeah, there you go. Now, we got it. And the Bible says, in whom you've seen today, you'll see him again no more. And that seems like the end of the story. And Moses said, oh, he said, you know, just do this. And he said, you know, cry to the Lord. And the Lord said to tell you this. But then the Lord said, one more thing. And man, here it is in verse 14. He said, the Lord will fight for you, but you've got to hold your peace. 
Now. You know what hold your peace means? It does not mean shut your mouth. It means maintain your peace. A lot of people mean, think, think that hold your peace means to shut your mouth. It really does. Because if you can shut your mouth, you'll usually get peaceful. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but the Lord said, look, look at this one more time, verse 13. Moses said unto the people, fear not, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. He's talking about seeing the deliverance of the Lord. He's going to show it to you today. The Egyptians whom you've seen today, you're going to see him again. And the Lord will fight for you. But he said, now, if the Lord's going to fight for you and God's going to deliver you, you've got to hold your peace. You know what it means? It means in a time, look this. <clears throat> it means in a time whenever peace would be like a dove and fly away off of you, whenever fear comes and trouble comes and you always react the same old way, and you're tempted for your fear to come in and for peace to just like a dove begin to fly away. Moses is saying, hold your peace. Don't let it fly away. Keep your mouth closed. Don't get into strife. Don't get into fear. Everybody just remain peaceful. Mm. You know, it's the truth. If you can remain peaceful, the warfare is powerful. How many of you have ever seen somebody in warfare, but it looked like they was full of discord? <sighs> you know, they're just out there doing all this kind of stuff. But whenever Jesus dealt with situations, he dealt with them from an aspect of peace. It's just like he said, come out of him and then, you know, hold your peace, come out of him, devil. You know, the Lord always had peace. When he was before Herod, he was like a lamb before his sheriffs. He was in peace, no strife in him. When he was on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Total control, total peace. And Jesus was overcoming left and right. The enemy was falling like crazy. Peter got in the strife, pulled his sword. Peter failed in everything he did. Jesus would not let strife get in and he overcome in everything he did. Now I want to show you, here's the scripture I'm going to and this is so powerful. This is what I've been waiting to show you. I want to show you something about the 70 when Jesus sent them out. Go over to the Gospels, to the book of Luke, chapter 10. Y'all with me? I want you to say this out loud with me. Pastor, I'm going to hold my peace. Next time the devil comes to me, Tries to provoke me. Tries to get me upset. I'm going to hold my peace. I'm going to maintain my peace. I'm going to protect the unity. I'm going to protect my anointing. I'm going to protect my blessing. Now, I want to show you something. If strife can affect the anointing, I believe strife can also affect the healing power of God and the delivering power of God. Is it any wonder why God is not moving more powerfully in our churches across America than he is because there's churches across America that's laying in the heaps and the ruins of the aftermath of strife. I was just at a church recently in the last few days where the pastor told me that years ago the church was on the main thoroughfare and it ran hundreds, if not thousands. He said he came in after 15 or 16 years and took the church and now the church is back, as God sent him there, it's back on the upswing because the pastor's doing what's right. And many of those people that had the problem 16 or 17 years ago is now coming back and making things right and the church is beginning to boom and grow. Now it's running hundreds. But there was a lapse of 15 or 16 years where hell had a heyday. Just as there's been lapses in churches where hell has had a heyday because strife crept in, 
You can be married 40 years and only be happily married five. You can be married for 15 years and only be married, happily married, for seven months. And the rest of the time, dead time. Totally unproductive because you've been in strife. But man, this is a powerful scripture. I want to show you, this is Revelation right here. I want you to see it with me. This is Jesus now, and he's sending out the 70. In chapter 10, look in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place where he would come. Now, I want you to stop right there and let me explain that to you. What this means is Jesus is telling these 70 guys he said, now I'm going to send you out two by twos. I'm going to send you over here to Capernaum. I'm going to send you over here to Samaria. And I'm going to send you over yonder to Judea. He's sending out 70 guys, see? And he's sending them out two by twos. And here's what the Lord is saying. I want you to get a picture of this now. This is powerful. He's saying, I'm sending you out yonder because I'm going to be coming there. But I want you to go before me and I want you to get everything ready for my coming because I'm going to be making a journey to these cities where I'm sending you. And the Lord said, now here's the way I want you to set things up for me. Therefore, he said unto them in verse 2, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, he will send forth labors in his harvest. Go your ways now. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Don't carry any purse with you or scrip nor shoes or salute. No man, by the way. Look at this. And into whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. Whew. Now watch this. It says, if the son of peace be there, your peace can rest on it. If it's not there, it shall turn to you again. And then he look at this. He said in verse 7, and in the same house, if there's peace there, go ahead and remain. You can eat there and drink there, such things as they give you. The labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. And whatsoever city you enter into, and they receive you, eat such things as set before you. And then he said, I want you to heal the sick that are there, and saying to them, the kingdom of God is coming to you. Whoa, 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 whoa. I just saw something here. In verse 9, he's talking about healing the sick. But it looks like to me that the healing of the sick is predicated on whether or not there's peace in the house. Whee! Is it, any, is it any wonder today that people are so concerned from their presidential candidates about Medicare and health insurance and all this stuff? Uh, I think there might be a better way. I think we might need to enter into a religious debate and say, kick the devil out of your house. Forgive one another. Let unity come in your house. Let the anointing return and there'll be health in your house. But if you want to continue to fight, vote me in because I'll get you some health insurance. Take care of you. Whew. I shouldn't have went there. I, I knew it when I started. I could just feel it. I shouldn't have went there. But I want to show you this. This is so powerful. Look at this in verse, verse, um, verse 5. It says, whatever house you enter into, he said, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to say, peace be to this house. And he said, if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. But if the son of peace is not there, it shall turn to you again. In other words, your peace will be so disturbed and so troubled, you won't be able to stay. And he said, in that same house where the peace is, he said, remain. And you can eat there and drink there. The labor is worthy of his hire. Don't go from house to house, but whatever city you enter into and they receive you, eat things that they set before you, and then I want you to begin to heal the sick and I want you to begin to preach the kingdom. And you know what? He's, here's what he's saying. He's saying if you go into a house and the son of peace is there and you speak peace there, he's saying when you speak the kingdom of God, the words that you speak about the kingdom of God will prepare the way when I come, I'll begin to manifest the kingdom of God among this city and among these houses. See, back then they didn't have the churches. They had the Jewish synagogues, but they kicked Jesus out. They had homes. So the home was the sanctuary. 
And so the Lord said, I'm going to send you out by twos. Knock on the door when you come to a city. If they invite you in and there's peace there, he said, the first thing I want you to do when you walk in that house is say, I pronounce and I speak peace over this house. And he said, if the son of peace is there, when you speak peace, your word will remain. But if you walk in that house and you say, I speak peace here. But if the son of peace is not there, he said, your peace won't last. And then he said, if you go in that house and you speak peace, and then it remains, he said, then you can start doing the healing. And then you can start preaching the kingdom of God because it'll fall on good ground. Man, that's a revelation, friend. I said, that's a revelation. I want to close today by asking this question. I'm not really through, but I need to quit. I want to ask this question. And you know nobody else can answer this but you. And I don't want no show of hands because this is, I know it's intensely personal. But I want, I want to ask this question. And I'm not talking to the person beside you, friend. I'm talking to you. I don't care who you are. I'm talking to you. I want to ask you a question. What about it with you? How are things with you and your wife? How are things with you and your husband? Is there a spirit of peace in your house? If I came to your house and I said, I speak peace over this house. If I spoke peace over your house, could it remain? Or in a matter of hours or a matter of days, the chaos would break out again and that peace would come back on me and the Lord would not be free to do what he wanted to do in your house. I wonder how many churches in America could the preacher get up and say, I speak peace in this house. But after a few Sundays, it flew back in his face. And all of a sudden he thinks, man, I need to move on. There's no peace here. I can't do what I want to do here. See what I'm saying? I believe that the Lord overcame by peace. I believe his warfare was a warfare of peace. God said to Israel, he said, just be still and see the salvation of the Lord and everybody hold your peace. Don't get fear and don't get in strife. Everybody just keep your peace. And I'll tell you something else. I didn't have time to cover this. I wish I had time, but peace will ruin your bones. Or, uh, lack of peace will ruin your bones. Strife will rot your bones out. Strife will ruin your health. Strife will ruin your arteries. Strife will ruin your blood. Strife, will, strife. Let me tell you something else while I'm thinking about it. Did you know that you can not only be in strife with an individual and you can not only be in strife against a place, but you can be in strife against yourself in your own mind. How do you know when you're in strife in your own mind? You know how you know? Because your flesh is in a struggle with your spirit. And when your flesh is in a struggle with your spirit, there's strife there. If your flesh can be hauled to the cross and crucified with Jesus and your spirit dictates, you've got peace. But as long as your flesh, you know in your heart what's right. The Bible says a man... Uh, what's, uh, say, what does it say sin is? It says um, to know to do right and do it not, it is a sin. You know what I believe? I believe every person that God's ever created on the face of the earth, I believe they're all created with the Ten Commandments in their heart. And when they break one of them, they know they've done something wrong. You let a little old bitty toddler lie and he'll get a real sheepish look on his face. You know why? Because God built those Ten Commandments in that young one. And he knows when he does wrong. And to know to do right and do it not, it's a sin. And you know what? Whenever you sin, your spirit says you've sinned and your mind says, oh, but I'm justifying it. You're in strife in your own self. Man, we need peace in our marriages. We need peace in our homes. We need peace in our churches. And we need peace of mind. Hallelujah. I want every person like we did last week, 
that would say, Brother Kilpatrick, something you said rang my bell. Stand up. Have you ever noticed when God's about to use you? God's put a fresh call on you or God's about to open a door for you that you've really wanted to have open. And right when that door is ready to open for you, the devil will come to you and get you all upset about something. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get you agitated because he knows that will hinder the anointing from making you effective. And he knows if you're not effective, when you get through, you'll feel defeated and you won't be as apt to want to do it again. You listening to me? That's why, friend, you have got to struggle and you've got to war to keep the unity and to keep the peace. There's some of you here today, I feel in my heart, that you have absolutely focused on your mate's flaws and you have not focused on your mate's strengths. And now you're so blind to their strengths, all you have an eye for now is the flaws. And just as you do that with a mate, you'll do that with a preacher. Just as you do that with a preacher, you'll do it with a politician. Just as you do it with a politician, you do it in every area. And after a while, you're so focused on flaws, you can't see the good. It's a spirit of strife. I call it a spirit because that's exactly what it is. It is a spirit sent from hell. Man, I want to ask the Lord today, and I know we have hundreds in the other building also this morning, and everybody's been so attentive and you've listened so attentively. And I know that in our hearts, God has stirred us all. He's spoken to us all. And I can tell you by experience, every new level that I move into in the Lord, before I move into that area, <whistles> severe test. The devil tries to get me all bent out of whack. But you've got to maintain that peace. I really sense so strongly that there are some marriages that must be repaired. There's a chasm between you and your husband. I'm speaking to somebody right now. I think this is a word of knowledge, and I want to move in it right now, but there's, there's an individual here today in leadership somehow. There's a spirit of strife that's developed in your marriage, and it's hindering you. Matter of fact, it's not only hindering you, but it's changing you. Some of your old ways is beginning to creep back up now and manifest themselves through you where the last number of months and years you have really moved in humility and power. But now all of a sudden a spirit of strife has gotten a hold of you and now you're taking on some old characteristics, some old ways of reacting to situations, and even your look is changing. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today to humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord and to humble yourself with your spouse. And the Lord said he will forgive and he will restore. But if you continue on and you will not humble yourself, that abrasiveness about you is going to become magnified and enhanced and your anointing is going to just keep dying back and you're going to really begin to go after the flesh, trying to do what God has called you to do in the flesh and you'll make a sharp left turn and you're going to really begin to move in the flesh. And I want to just caution you today for you and your husband, you and your wife to really get together and not to try to justify your positions with one another because that's going to make it worse. But for both of you, to just humble yourself 
and go back to your first love and to go back to where you first began and there will be a fresh anointing, there'll be a fresh peace and there'll be a fresh rest for your soul. And I speak that to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I'll tell you what I want to do today. I know that we've gone a little bit long here, but this is one of those services where I feel like if I didn't do something like this, I would miss the Lord. I want everybody to move your chairs. I want you to move them over to left or right. We usually don't do this on Sunday morning. I'd like everybody to be standing, please, in all the buildings. Thank you for moving those chairs. I appreciate that. We're opening up the front of the building right now. I wanted to make some room today because I don't feel like the Lord would be happy with me if I dismissed the service and just sort of let everybody just sort of filter out of here and blend out of here. But I feel like this is one of those services where God is really, I mean, he has really rang your bell and he's really spoken something to your heart. If you're here today, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a first time visitor today or you've been here for 40 years. If God has really spoken something to your heart today and you feel like that you need to humble yourself, I'm not going to ask you to kneel. I'm just going to ask you to come and stand. I want you to do that right now. Come on. Do it quickly. Whoever you may be, come on. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. rest of you may be sitting out there thinking or standing out there thinking, well, I'm going to keep my place here because I'm going to beat the crowd out of the parking lot. But if you need to be up here, I really am going to insist here for just a few minutes that you make a move and come on. I think that walk of faith is going to be part of your deliverance. It's going to be a walk of faith and it's going to be part of God delivering you. And I want you to do that right now. Wherever you are, if you're in the balcony, we're going to wait on you. Just come on, wherever you may be, we're going to wait on you. Man, there's a lot of people responding. How many of you would say here today, Brother Kilpatrick, I sure could use more peace in my home? Could I see your hand, please? Could sure use more peace in my home. Did you see that a while ago in the scripture? Did you see that? Where it said, when you walk in that house, speak peace. And he said, if the son of peace is there, your peace will remain. But if the son of peace is not there, it'll come back. But it said, if the son of peace is there and you speak peace, it said, then you can begin to move in the kingdom of God and then you can begin to move in healing. I believe that there's people here in this church today and across the street in the overflow, I believe that there's people here today that your healing is going to come not by a needle and not by surgery, but I believe your healing is going to come whenever the peace is restored. I want everybody right now just to lift up your hands and let's begin to receive from the Lord right now. Come on. Just lift your voices up with me and just begin to talk to the Lord. Just go ahead and talk to the Lord for a few minutes. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Thyself in the sight of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he will lift you up higher and higher, and he will lift you. Mm -hmm. Humble 
your trouble, yes, yes. He will lift you up higher and higher, and He will lift you up. God's doing something right now, and I'm not going to talk for a few minutes. So I want you just to bask in his presence. It just feels like the sun's out in here. I feel the sun, the sun rays of the presence of God. I want you just to stand out there and soak it in right now. Let God give you the strength to do what you got to do. Let him just begin to energize you right now to do what you need to do. Come on, just, just, just soak it in right now, friend. Just soak it in. Hallelujah. that in friend that's an anointing that the Lord is sending you right now peace just breathe it in matter of fact there's there's probably not anything to this and I'm not trying to make something out of it but I just want you to open your mouth right now and just breathe it in just breathe in the presence of the Lord breathe that in and breathe the old out <clears throat> this is just symbolic just symbolic just open your mouth and breathe it in and breathe the old out. We love you, Lord. We breathe your peace for us today, Jesus. You're talking to us. God, you're getting ready to do something awesome, something so powerful that none of us really knows what you're about to do. But we've got to do some house cleaning. We've got to get our house in order. Whew. in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up higher
I'll pray for you. Won't you extend your hands this way? Let me pray for you. Everybody in the audience, if you will, including those over there in the other building, I want you to just extend your hands toward the screen. I'm going to stretch forth my hands and we're going to pray together. I'm just going to pray for you. Jesus, I know today that there's a lot of people that's come in this building and in their heart they know that somehow they've been contaminated by a spirit of strife and they don't really know how it happened and some of them don't even know how it got in. But after we've been talking about it, they know it's there. And that's all we're concerning ourselves with. And Holy Spirit, as their shepherd, I pray for them that the sweet Spirit of the Lord would go with them from this house today. And when we dismiss and walk out of here, that that sweet Spirit and that sweet fragrance of your lingering near us in this service would follow them in their cars and would follow them to their homes when they open the doors and where that agitation and irritation has been there for so long. I pray, Lord, when the key goes in the lock or when the garage door goes up, that thing will just go in the name of Jesus and it will just fall to the ground limp and non-effective, sterile. And Lord, let a new spirit of hope and unity and anointing and peace move in their homes. Lord, let that spirit linger above their bed. Let their sleep be sweet. Lord, I pray that even as they leave tomorrow morning and go to their jobs and places of employment, their businesses, that it would follow them even there and they would just begin to think tomorrow and say, you know, I just feel different today. Lord, give us the courage and the fortitude to make those crucial decisions that we need to make over the next seven days to not fall back into old routines, but Lord, to take a stand and hold our peace Whenever we see the devil behind us and all kind of obstacles around us, we just won't let our peace leave. We'll just stand there in the, peace, in the sweet spirit of peace that God's given us today. And Lord, we'll move in that and we'll love our mates in that and we'll converse again and we'll communicate again and not bicker and fuss and criticize and fault find. Lord, we speak today that that just leave our mouth and let a spirit of communication begin to break out of our mouth from the alabaster box of our spirit. And Lord, let there come a change in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friend. Thank you so much. We love you. We'll see you next week.